So last time we look at the project management workflows. Uh, just a recap: How do we get started on the project numbers and the project data forms? And some of the contract issues. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the three-month uh, look-ahead resource allocation spreadsheet. When we went through that, we we'll look at the the invoicing and the project reports. Uh, and then we've uh, uh, reviewed the uh, project uh, income reporting for individual projects, which is uh, coming uh, in the work right now. So just to sink in a little bit here. And this is a file uh, that uh, Sylvia put out for us after the meeting. This is a note. Uh, I re encourage you guys to review this and how uh, individual responsibilities as far as the flow process is concerned is fairly uh, documented here. Uh, particularly for PM, right? to complete a project data form. That's a collection of the information we wanted to start with. And have the folder set up properly and get the schedule, uh, which we're gonna talk about uh, today again. And then start the working with the subs and make sure all the paperwork is in place so that uh, uh, some of the execution, this is some of the execution elements that we spoke about as well as how uh, the most information is uh, uh, passed through with the system. Start of that process and uh, work with Sylvia uh, on a monthly basis. Get get that in uh, through the process. And here is the notes that you you've seen some of the data that you can always go back and refresh yourself. Uh, how to get proper information in place? Uh, it's fairly uh, straightforward. We send all, all of this information in Moist. So uh, now let's get into this session, uh, project execution and the control. The first thing we like to do is to have a two group again to to think about, you know, for this particular topic, what is it that we want to know? You know, what what, what it means to us in terms of project execution and control. Uh, for example, in order for me to execute this project, control the project, uh, I need to have a schedule. Okay, I'm gonna note it. Let's, let's do that. Let's just uh, split it to, to group here. So if you look across a lot of uh, common common things, right? Schedule is common. Uh, budget is a very common. Resource is common. QQC common. So sub common. Progress coordination meetings. Client management. Uh, we have those uh, public contacts. Okay, so, so there are a lot of uh, common uh, grounds. So in, in terms of one uh, point that I want to make, in terms of uh, execution and control, right? Some of the things you already know is uh, really the subject before it occurred. For example, scope. Before you're given the opportunity to manage the project, scope is already there. You just have to dive into more scope. Uh, schedule may or may not be there. Uh, budget, you know, is there. How do you do that? We'll, we'll, we'll go through some of these uh, items and see how that shape up. Uh, another thing that I want to kind of, before this get a comments on, some of these activities, we need to think about execution, how to group things together. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on a little bit. 
Okay, so the first one is uh, project schedule. Project schedule is a must for all the PMs. Uh, right now, I think uh, our practice is for a smaller project, some of us uh, have not really uh, rigorously prepared the schedule. Uh, we, we, we should really look at that. So now, from a, a schedule standpoint, what, what are the kind of the tools we, we use? Um, very common tools that we, we were using for Mina, we're going to show an example, is a Microsoft project. Uh, I've been talking to Roy to make sure we get access to Microsoft project from, for every one of our PMs. This is going to be either in a newer copy, online copy, or desktop copy. Some of us have a desktop copy right now. But I think uh, uh, very soon we want to make sure everybody has access to that. But for a smaller uh, type of project, you can do a spreadsheet. We, you know, some of them spreadsheet or even a piece of paper. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Yeah. Uh, other for a very complicated uh, schedule again, uh, Primavera is one of the uh, programs people use very popular in the market. For us, we haven't uh, you know get into that kind of com complexity yet. Another thing that we need to uh, really do or understand is the work breakdown structure. Yeah. We're gonna have a little bit example and uh, exercise for that. Uh, Caltrans example. Um, another one we're going to do example is self directed. Now, not a really uh, get into a rigorous structure of a uh, work breakdown structure. But I wanted to show a Caltrans example how that looks like uh, for just our purpose. Uh, work breakdown structure uh, for Caltrans is a very big uh, topic and is a very uh, well defined. So if you want to dive into that subject for our own uh, uh, project, I would suggest you to look through this and, and get a little bit uh, uh, idea how uh, Caltrans laid it out. And this is a manual that is in the uh, R drive. <coughs> Just to flush it through this uh, resource, basically, it, it talks about what it is and how the different pieces are breaking it out. So, what was the basic idea of this? I'm wanting to get into the. This is a high-level look of how everything all comes together for Caltrans. And they break it down to different phases, like, like say phase K, phase 0, phase 1. In the phase, phase, phase K, they're starting at the project initiation documents. You know, uh, we heard a lot about the PSR. Uh, P, P, PDS, PSR, PDS, a lot of those happen here. We know a lot about the PSN and E, which falls into uh, uh, phase one of the documents, and the environmental documents. So all of this has the coding to assign to it. And if you look at the, the whole uh, picture, it covers you know every aspect of Caltrans project. You know right away utilities, <coughs> drainage, you know different designs and give you uh, a relationship. Um, if, if you have a very good understanding how Caltrans break it down, uh, sometimes for a project, if I don't know the project, uh, really how this flows, I sometimes go back to this and kind of remind myself 
do I need a landscape architect, for example, or whatever the situation is? Um, I think accountants, they have done a very good job. And sometimes if you go to accountants interview to ask about this. I don't know if you remember last time they we, we yeah, rehearsed yeah. about the uh, you know, WBS. They asked questions about uh, Do you know work breakdown structure of us? And you, you wanted to be able to articulate, oh, yeah, for phase K, with, you know, there's a few elements of that. Uh, I'm obviously we're not trying to teach uh, this uh, whole manual here. Uh, the purpose uh, I'm trying to deliver right now is there's a resource. There's a very very defined work breakdown structure philosophy and, and theory already you know, and you can always go there to, to take advantage of it. Okay, go back to our presentation. Okay, so I wanted to look at a schedule as example, which is a term in item Y. I loaded up here already. So most of us know this, right? We're, we're seeing this, we've, we've done in some sort of capacity. It's a matter of a complexity of how we want to get to it, which we will have a quick exercise of that. But if you look at the schedule, uh, again, this side of this information is uh, scope, tasks. And this is really a, a the work breakdown structure. This is. This would be, I would call, self-directly custom work breakdown. So with this, this doesn't follow Caltrans flow exactly, but a lot of essence is there. So this is what you would do according to the scope of work in the proposal, and you break it down a little bit further how you want to run this project. It, it could be similar to what you stated in the proposal, or it could be slightly different, depends on the situation. And obviously, the schedule has a starting time and a finish time. But very importantly, is this a relationship? What, what is the predecessor and then what is a pro predecessor? <laughs> what's what's coming in? Right. Uh, certain tasks has to follow on the previous task because of the nature of it, right? Um, and that needs to be reflected. Uh, schedule uh, because of that relationship uh, critical path is is what goes through the whole process where which some of the pieces that uh, force in the critical path you need to pay closer attention to because that's gonna really influence the overall duration another piece is that uh, is the milestone for example kickoff is is a, what, what the markers we want to highlight what the milestone is uh, some middles is one of the milestones for example here you know whichever the some middle is the the another piece we want to make sure is allocate enough uh, time for the review uh, if you work with Caltrans, you say, "Hey, well, I get two weeks for you to review." You know, people know you. You're, <laughs> you're, you're not being realistic, right? And you want to really know what the agency wants for the review. Cal Caltrans want six weeks. You gotta give them six weeks for the first some some middle. There's no no way to shorten that. For Port of Long Beach. You got to go talk to them, see if what sort of a commitment they are willing to give to you, then you assign that so you have some dialogue beforehand. Okay, and this is a Microsoft project. Um, <coughs> if we need a little bit more uh, uh, help on, on this, um, we can arrange that. Maybe have somebody come in to do a lunch session for us, uh, some vendors that can walk through uh, how to use the program. Today is not uh, meant to uh, teach us uh, how to use the program itself. It's just uh, to, to demonstrate you know, some of the key elements of it. 
Peter, normally you don't expect every PM knows how to do it, okay? You would, you know, perform like this one, you need a special team guy, manage the whole thing for everybody as a kind of service support. Uh, to develop a schedule or to, yeah, to maintain the schedule? It all depends on how, what level of schedule you want to do, right? Uh, you know, you can have level one, you can level two. This one is like, you know, level level four already. And then, you know, going down level five, level six, you know, that's uh, going to the construction because uh, in the construction, you know, they involve, you know, more money, more mm -hmm. activities, okay? So, but in our profession, <coughs> I think that you know, level one, level two will be sufficient now rather right? than you know, doing all this kind of thing. Unless you know, the client wants you to do it. Yeah. So it depends on the size of the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, Good okay. point. Yeah, okay. I think uh, that's uh, why we're, we're saying that there's a different tools we can use. You can use spreadsheet. If it's something that the client doesn't require, it's simple enough, just run the spreadsheet. Yeah. Or run a piece of paper, make a copy, <laughs> pass, yeah. a, pass around. Yeah. Uh, I don't think uh, the idea is to uh, get a buck down, make it a project, uh, schedule as a project. Uh, for this case, the client is looking for this. I mean, uh, you, you have to make this a presentable to be able to uh, present it to the client. Okay. So I, th I think there's a couple of things about the schedule. <clears throat> One is that if you do a schedule and you provide it to the client, it is a plus point. It shows credibility and it has a good, <clears throat> they have the impression you've thought through the project. And if you never monitored the schedule, and which I'm not advocating, but if you never did, but you took the time to do that, you would have studied the project and understood the details of the project better. So I think there's value in it. <clears throat> I, I don't worry about the start date initially. I think about what are the things that have to be done, which is why this is tied to work breakdown structure, and what is each thing that has to be done, how long does each thing take, what has to be done before I can do that. And so you might notice in this schedule there are some blue bars that are floating in space. And that raises a flag to me and I go, like that one up near the top, I go, um, that doesn't precede anything because I don't see an arrow going off of it anywhere. So to me, I always want to have things linked in time <clears throat> because, and in that case, it's pretty obvious execute contract. But um, but anything else further down, master meeting, master planning, and there's there's no nothing at the end. It says, what's the importance of that? So to me, it's like everything has to lead to something else. Uh, even if it leads way down the road, and that's when you can identify the float. It says, eh, I really don't have to start that, and I can do that anywhere in there. But it starts to help shape what you have to do on your project. So the key, though, is what do I have to do, how long does it take, what has to happen before I can do it. Yeah. So one thing I will tell you is that in the future for projects, when projects kick off, uh, a question is going to be asked, where is the schedule from the PM? So that has to happen. To, to run the project without a schedule is very dangerous. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of uh, enforce that. I already told Sylvia that's one of the checklists we're going to gonna ask for uh, during, you know, like a project data form is that being done, this contract's been done. Have you developed a schedule? Those are the fundamental stuff to kick off the project is required. Yeah, the other thing is remember last time we connected the schedule to cash flow. Right? You could look at it, you could see when your major tasks were. So even if you did it simple, you could say, I'm going to spend about 20% of my budget here, which then relates as a tool back to that backlog. So you can sort of use that to help you, but it helps get an idea about how you're spending along the way. Okay. Okay, so now we are gonna do a exercise. <laughs> give, give that an introduction. <clears throat> so the exercise is, this is a project that Marco is gonna manage. 
uh, one, one of the pieces. So we'll take a few minutes to read about it. We want to do two things. One is uh, do a work breakdown structure. Uh, two is to lay out a, a timeline, schedule. So which one precedes what and you know what we see how this is going to work out. If you look at this uh, handout, I only give you the background. Let's focus on Plan 217. That's the only one we're going to do. Uh, and then a, a fee structure which has uh, some chunk of uh, the work breakdowns. And then uh, side photos stuff. I took out the scope of work for the purpose of this uh, exercise <laughs> because I want you to kind of figure out the breakdown and the what scope of work uh, uh, leads to breakdown and uh, how this um, is in flush out. Let's take a couple minutes to read it and then we can ask a question on it.
comment on it, you can comment on it. Yeah. Why, why don't you do that? Who, who is going to talk? Marco. Yeah, Marco. On, on. This is already on. So kind of walk through the mindset and uh, the idea of it. Okay. So we we started. We assumed um, we got. Uh, we got notice to proceed already, and then we we did kick off already. So first task after that is um, data collection, uh, getting as well as record information, and then um, survey and geotech can go um, at the same time. We we just assuming right now a survey will take two weeks, um, geotech will take three weeks, and those are the um, these three are the predecessor to task four, design memo, which uh, includes uh, alternatives for civil, structural, and landscaping to be presented to the client. We're assuming right now that's three weeks, um, and this will be the predecessor to. Review by the by, by the client, and we put down two weeks. Following that is 90% design. We're assuming four weeks, and that includes civil, structural, and landscaping also. And then QA, QC, and then um, agency review after that. And we just stopped after that. We know we have more. We have 100% design still, and then submittal to the to the county or the agency to review it, but we just stopped it for now, right there. Okay. Uh, Gilbert or Travis, you want to work on it? Sylvia. Sylvia. Yeah, Sylvia. I forgot about her. Thank you. So, we have a few disclaimers first. Uh, first disclaimer, we already have the project information. We have established relationship with Covina, or it's not Covina. It's the firm water. Uh, yeah, so we already have established relationships, so we have all the as built and everything, and we have no work, and this is our only project. So the first step is contract so, or subcontract agreements. Get, that, get those in place. Um, can't do anything until we have those done. The next thing is a kickoff meeting to identify the client needs and uh, basically properly kick off the meeting with all the sub-consultants. Then we said uh, topo would be the next step, would take about three days, um, assuming they don't have any work either, um, about a day for survey and two days for data entry. So the predecessor for the topo survey would be the kickoff meeting, obviously. And then step four would be the geotech report. Uh, there's several items that are tied to the geotech report. Uh, dig alert, boring, permit, field exploration, testing, reporting, analysis, and then a preliminary, and then a title, and then the final report. So these are all kind of predecessors. As you move down, each one becomes a predecessor for the next one. So uh, we assume two days for dig alert, boring, permit, and then three days for the field exploration, and then making up the testing reporting analysis was the preliminary and final report, which is 10 days, we're assuming. And then once that's all completed, or I guess the civil, the civil could have started a little earlier at the preliminary report when they, when they identify some of the parameters in there. So that was a predecessor uh, also for this. Also uh, Topo survey. And to, yeah, and to and Topo as well. So uh, the site plan, you, you developed the site plan at 5A, which took five days, and then structural and landscape kind of fed in after that, and then the final submittal was uh, about 20 days, at, or we submitted after 15 days, and then we gave 20 days for review. And we don't do anything wrong, so. And we don't do anything wrong, so no QAQC. <laughs> <laughs> We're good, guys. <laughs> we, we, we weren't busy at all, so we didn't to. <laughs> Good. So I will comment on this uh, first, and then I will have a uh, Rick to to uh, add on to it. So I like it. I appreciate it. So both exercises actually capture the 
majority of essence that I have in mind. So, but I wanted to add a few more things that it, it didn't come out. Um, to do a schedule, the first thing we know is a. Uh, The first thing we know is we have a lot of cues. Clue, cues, clues, clues, clues. Is that right? We have a lot of clues. Like what? Can you was trying to, trying to refuse that? You already have a scope of work, which I, don't, I didn't give it to you. You have a, for this case, a, a fee breakdown. So there's some information you already have. Uh, perhaps those are the schedule breakdown needs to be advanced if you're a project manager uh, on the on the proposal phase. You already have that exercise. When you execute it, you have a plan to execute. You already thought about it. Let's assume that uh, you're handed to a project. I mean, this is the context, right? You never get involved in a proposal. You're handed to a context. You have a lot of cues, clues, cues, clues. The second thing that it didn't come out is that. Uh, uh, you need to really flow this in the big chunks, <clears throat> which is which is what I laid out here. Did you see this? This a big task cap, big task cap. A big task in the schedule has an overall bracket to to bracket the information. Like a, like all of this here, all of this. Um, this is, has a little bit more clarity to that. This has a, a less clarity. To it. The logic thing to do is uh, the first first thing is contracting. Right? This, the second thing is, is, uh, is data. Collecting data. A kickoff is a big part. A kickoff is a kickoff here. Or kick off here. It depends on how you you run it. Sometimes I like to do collecting desktop information first before I request a kick off because I already know some. Or other way around, I wanted to kick off with the client before I spend any time on the project. That's kind of different the flavor of it. That's kick off could fall either case. So the the third big, the, the next big big chunk is a preliminary engineering. And now you, you get into the, to the design, right? Preliminary engineering has a lot of studies, geotech, survey, survey comes first, and study all of that. Here is come to uh, several different disciplines. You, you go through that whole process, right? And this is how we would lay out in our scope of work anyways. And from there, you have a milestone, some middles. 30% and repeat that. To 65% and go along that. If you like a structure this flow this way here, then you would be able to capture a lot of the tasks because that's the first thing we have to do, right? We, we want to dump all the tasks in one place and make sure they're, they're covered. The next thing you will do is to do the criticism, how the relationship works. You know, you, in your head or you know, a piece of paper or just write on the schedule, that's what the, the, the stuff is gonna come in. Okay, uh, you can't really do the structure without, uh, for example, geotech in place. Now you identify the, the relationship. You can't really do the civil design without the, the topo is in place. That, that's naturally. Uh, okay, you, you, can, you, can, you can't do the uh, kickoff without contracting, for example, <laughs> How, or, however that is. So this is how, this is chunk off, and underneath you identify whatever that is. So the the third thing that I didn't come up come out with usually missing is the interface with the agencies. For example, uh, review. For example, coordinations. 
for example, PDT meetings, all of those. If you recall in the scope of work, right, we don't really have a, a cost item per se for reviews. We just say, we'll submit a 6% milestone, we'll move on to 90% design. But on the schedule context, this has to come in. You, you, you can, this, this has a, a time, a, a, a window of time needs to come into a schedule. In the scope of work, it didn't really have that gap persons. Similarly with the coordination, when coordination happens periodically along the time, you may have a, just one, one line item in the scope of work, but that, that duration sense is not reflected in the scope of work, and, and it has to be reflected somehow in, in the schedule sense. And same thing with the PDT, we say, okay, we're gonna do 10 meetings in the scope of work, that's what we said. But from a, a duration standpoint, it, it is not clear uh, in the scope of work, and it needs to be clear in, in the schedule. What else? I, that's what I can think of. Why don't you jump in here? I've got a couple of things that might would elaborate on that a little bit. So one is these these things are good to have in there. They might find themselves within the context of what you're doing. So you might say you might come across in your schedule and say design, but then the next item might say review meeting or check-in meeting. So you could actually have it in the context. And what I like to do is on the right side there, where the symbols and the dates are, there is a way to label those meetings at that location. So anybody, clients aren't good at reading that, but they can see on the bar chart, review meeting right across the top there or submittal, and they can pick up the key things. I think this is really nice. I like that a lot. The only thing that I found interesting is how much we detailed our subs work and didn't detail any of ours. So to me, this is our work. So I probably on this, and this is true for both, civil structural, I probably would have said, because remember, I'm trying to figure out our breakdown structure and I want the client to know what we're doing. I might have said develop drainage concept because I read all this stuff about ditches in there. Develop drainage concept. Develop... Uh, wall sections and develop grading, something like that. Those three then lead to finalized memo. Some, you, you see where I'm going with that? That's going to help you put time frames on the tasks. And also, when you're going back to assign work to people, that was what I was saying before about if you do a schedule like that, you've thought the job through. If I just take the scope item, write concept memo, it doesn't look, maybe, I know you know it because you wrote scope, but it may not look like I've thought it through to the client. So, so those are things I do. The other thing I do, although it's, this is more job to job, but you could say the preliminary engineering and put all that stuff together, but I sometimes like to highlight our work out from our subs. So how do you do that? Well, you might say field investigations or something like field investigation, and under that you might have topo and geotech, so now you can get to civil structural activities or constant memos so that we're singled out. We still show all that stuff with its own bar chart like Peter suggested because I think that was an important point, the blocks. And they can fluctuate a little bit from one to the next, but to explain what we're doing for our own work I think is, is where we're really gonna sell the client a little bit. And then I think, I think you had most of the other stuff in there. You know, like, um, you know, again, it was more general. This, the detail of that, um, and I know that's because you guys have been stung on that stuff, and so you really know that stuff from some of our other projects. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, just the way you thought this through, well, yeah. because yeah. because these things, it sounds easy to say geotech report, but if you're geotech and everybody's not on top of these other things, you never get them out in the field to get the work done. So uh, overall, I think that was really um, good job. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Come. You want to be on the camera? No. <laughs> um, I think it's good. Um, I think that uh, 
you probably you know, want to also understand the fundamental uh, also for project for schedule, right? So uh, here seems to me that you make you know task and activity together, right? In project control, we talk about two jargons that uh, establish the fundamental way to understand, all right? Events. Okay, events and elements. Protein, durations, critical paths, milestone. Alright, so you have to understand these control factors. So events equal to so-called task. Alright? And then you know, here you mix a, a kind of level one, level two, level three, level four kind of things that uh, can use yourself, right? So you want to establish events first. And then under each event, you have an element. So in, in the jargon here, element means activity. So level one elements could be level two events. And level two activity could be level three events. So you just think about it this way, all right? So establish yourself depends on the size of project. Um, you can have just uh, you know two level, and I believe that here you have you know two level maximum, right? Then you know then you will be able to really define what you want to achieve, right? So here you have two tasks in here, right? So you have two events. And under event, you know, you have elements. Okay. And then, you know, under element, you can have sub elements. Okay. Then, you know, if you, cur you have this clear picture, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example, here, you know, geotech is a report, you know, but you don't dig into well, what the contents of geotech reports because it becomes like a level six already. You don't want to do that. Yeah. All right. So, and here you forget about, you know, it's very real idea. You, you know, the way I see it, you know, you're going to lose money already, right? <laughs> no, we're not going to lose money, Katie. Because you don't, you, you, you don't have enough schedule to carry, to finish your global survey. Wait, you, okay. you, don't, have, you, don't, have, you, don't, you don't have enough schedule to uh, finish, you know, your ge geotechnical investigation. Hmm. It takes okay. four weeks, you know, to get permits. Yeah, I know. Right. All right. Yeah. So here, so 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 those kind of things that you know, <laughs> not 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 embedded in this schedule. All right. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. So consider you know, this kind of thing. All right. Thank you. Okay. okay so one one last quick point. Mm -hmm. When you run those durations, and you link everything like you've done, and then you run that out, you may not like your end date because you're going to go back to your contract and go, wait a minute, I only have 90 days, and that's adding to 140. Yeah. Uh oh. So now you start looking at, okay, like one of you said before, hey, we could actually start that task when we have half the information. Like the drainage concept, you could start that right away. You probably have enough data, record data, and then fine tune it when you get a topo, stuff like that where you could pick up time. So that's a common occurrence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, 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 we were not, uh, Saying I was not saying this. This is this is critical to be there for uh, exactly like what uh, Rick just said. For agencies, sometimes to look at big chunks, to look at thirty percent milestone, sixty-five percent milestone, ninety-four percent milestone. Those are days in their memory. Uh, for us, we wanted to see from thirty-five percent milestone to sixty-five percent. Is that a, a month or six months? So we we gotta have a sense. Okay, the schedule is uh, is uh, not out of whack. So those are really critical for us to to look at the bigger picture, see if it makes sense or not, and then, and then kind of make sure those are big days always in your head when you communicate with a client. This is this is super. This is very good. <laughs> okay, let's uh, move on to next next uh, topic. Any questions? Okay. Any yeah. Any questions? Five minutes. Yeah. No, I, I break. Yeah. Say that I mm -hmm. gave the KT on the levels of information. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. 
how far, not, uh, you know, uh, how much details we should give. Is level three good enough for this type of project? Maybe, you know, because you don't want to give too much breakdown. So do like what I did here. So team use, I have two versions of a schedule. One's uh, for, the, for the client, one's for the team use. So you have the ability to communicate however you want with the client. For this particular case, the client's uh, schedule is actually longer than what my team schedule is. I, I took away a month or so yeah. within the team. You can do the level of complexity as well. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you, you have those kind of uh, yeah. flexibilities. Yeah. And sometimes, in, in my opinion, the client wants more of a top-down view. The client's not going to care on certain events. Like he yeah. was saying, He's, they don't care. They want to know the geotech report is going to be completed. They right. don't want to know the dig alert, boring from a field of exploration. But we need to know that. Yeah. So that's I like to put that stuff in the schedule, though. And that's why I label it on the right side. So it says geotech report available. So if they want to, they can just look at that. But I find that it's impressive to the client that we thought the job through, even if they don't look at everything. And it, it's a value that they see. I can maybe do something in an hour that they think I spent two days on yeah. because of the way I can add that stuff in. The other thing is when they start asking questions, which happens, when they go, well, when do you think they're going to be on site doing that work? Because I've got to clear such and such off to make sure they can be there. And I can go right over to that site and say, well, right now we're projecting they're going to be there in this two-week period. So it, it helps you think on your feet when you're ready. So, and if it's simple stuff, yeah, you're not spending a lot of time on it. You're still staying in the level KT suggested, but you're adding a couple more things within that in that level maybe, but it's, uh, it's case by case. Yeah. Well, case well, by case, yeah. Well, you know, be, be, be careful, right? You know, um, one time it happened to me. That so, okay. So the next uh, on the PowerPoint is a project budget. So there's only, only a few points. Uh, the first point that the scope and the fee estimate is already been discussed in the section session three so we we already know how to get the right uh, amount of budget for the project uh, i also have this uh, example here just let me just uh, well, let me just uh, finish finish this uh, point first where's my mouse So as far as execution is concerned, uh, what is important is uh, allocate uh, your budget. You have overall authorization. You have your uh, scope of fee in place. Now it's time to execute it. There is an opportunity or potential you wanted to reshuffle things around to, in order uh, to manage it per your own personal style. Uh, it's also uh, important to have uh, some buckets, so you have a, a bigger picture as supposed to be always in the weeds, right? Another thing is that uh, there may be some innovative ways to execute your project. When you go negotiate with a client based on scope of work, is a standardized process. Perhaps there's a, some uh, a caveats you build into the system that you know you're going to be able to extract some uh, 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 efficiency out of it. Now is the time to kind of exercise those things. The very important part is obviously to monitor the budget as we, you move forward, which we already talked about quite a bit uh, already. So this is the one that I use for Port of Long Beach Terminal I know why. Uh, you see there's a lot of tops in here. And that's my attempt to uh, kind of bucket the budget in different pieces uh, for different monitor purposes. Uh, they're all the same information. In, in the summary, it shows the big task, 
shows the grand total, shows the different uh, consultants, what is uh, uh, used and what is uh, still remain, and all of that uh, comes across. Uh, the all is a complete uh, compilation of the overall project for the entire team. So everything, all, all the detailed information there. Uh, however, it's all to further break it down between the consultants. Uh, and this is just a, my particular way to do this particular project. You know, it's different, uh, all different pieces that uh, uh, help me to see it quickly, you know, as a clarity as I move forward. Uh, obviously, for a, any given project, you can do whatever you like. For the project which is gone through, it's logic to have two, two, at least a two bucket, right? One's for the tank side, one's for the access road. That, that's pretty, perhaps that's how the client wants to see it too. Yeah. So the next bit we we'll talk about in the earlier exercise is the resources. We we'll talk about this quite a bit, but it's important when you get in the execute, you want to bring the team together. Who, who are the team? The team might change at the execution from the proposal stage. It depends on what it is. But you, you got to know the team. You got to know the reporting hierarchy, who is the PM, who is the principal. Who's your project engineer? Who's a designer? Who's a, who's a drafter? And does it make sense to to you from the hierarchy standpoint? And that needs to be worked out. In other resources, is a uh, project level. You you got to do a, a research or a development process to find out wh what I need to know. Uh, the criteria, design criteria, manuals. Do I have even uh, some examples of this pro this project? For example, uh, you know, purple line section one. Let's let's grab those plans. That's going to be useful for us, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll do that. Uh, we need to really get an understanding of uh, the tools. Is this a micro station project or 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 rivet project or? You know, uh, AutoCAD, uh, Silver 3D, uh, to before we get uh, too much uh, ahead of it. But it's pretty, pretty uh, simple. The next piece is a uh, project management plan. So let me open uh, one example too. And this example we use for the 710 utility corridor study. Uh, actually, another consultant is the prime or the sub. Uh, and this, uh, we, we prepared this for Terminal Island Y project as well. But this one is a different perspective, so I, brought, I have the copy of the whole plan here. Uh, what, if you look across the table of contents, you, you, will, you will know a lot of things that we talked about is uh, compiled in this one document. For a larger complex project, uh, the client may require you to do this. Uh, but for a smaller project, um, this is all, you need to be mindful of the same information in order for us to execute, right? The general information on the project, so the reader knows uh, some backgrounds, uh, who are the teams, what is the scope of work, uh, who is doing what, what is the com communication protocols, one of the bullets is, is, is in the board earlier. Uh, we'll talk about the schedule, we'll talk about the money, uh, we'll talk about the uh, document control, the, the file management CAD standards, uh, QQC, which uh, is going to come up, we'll spend a little bit more time on that, uh, some of the other elements. All of this is a collection of, of the same information we kind of talk about in different pieces in, in one coherent uh, document. Um, and this uh, plan is actually submitted to the client for approval. Uh, for Terminal Island Y, we did the same thing. We have to submit this plan to the client 
for official approval to guide us uh, execution. Uh, now we're not going to go through each one of the pieces, but uh, just to know uh, we do have examples. We we have done those things. Uh, if you are to required to do the same thing, there's uh, resources that you can uh, jump into. So the next slide is uh, progress report and monitoring. Uh, some of this we already mentioned about uh, during the execution is very important to close and monitor. Is as a project manager's job is to uh, stay on top of it. Uh, weekly, you got for a larger size of project with a consultant, you gotta have a weekly conference call uh, to check in. Uh, monthly PDT meetings for Caltrans, that's a must. You have to do that. Uh, progress report, um, monthly invoicing. What's PDT? PDT is a project development team uh, meetings. So it's, uh, every month the, you, you go meet with the client and with stakeholders. It's a, it's a whole process at Caltrans. Another important skill set for a PM is really to uh, anticipate ahead of everybody else. Uh, not only the team, also the client. You gotta have to feel the client, what's going on with the client. Be able to anticipate it, kind of stay in front of it. Uh, let's see, I, I have an example I wanted to kind of just show here, just the term 9 and Y, before I hand it to, uh, So Rick, here is uh, a regular, this is one example, for example, this is just a, is a, not like a, we have to do this at, every time, but it shows uh, uh, the level of details we've done before. This is an invoice, a cover sheet, uh, additional information that the client requires. A summary of information with a lot of uh, tracking details in there. Insurance, you can identify there. Here's a, a time and material contract. All the tasks, the, the hours is uh, reported for the month. The next task, same thing, goes through the same process. This is all produced from a spreadsheet. We, we set it up, agree with the client, and, and uh, kind of start tracking that, that. Same thing here. Sub-consultants uh, invoices copied within this package, and there are numbers refl reflected in the spreadsheet earlier. Uh, they require the SBE reporting within the monthly report as well, so that the information is tracked and reported. That's what we're talking about property report. Most of us are doing that right now. So we basically document the, uh, this one here. They will ask to report per task. Some project will just report it per project, and this one get in a little bit more uh, detail. Each, each task is, is what's the status for this month and what is anticipated for next month. And you can go even further for, for this one, for example, uh, we set up a, a projection, project projection, a budget projection. And what is the budget amount, who, who has the budget, and how the expenditure versus the planned expenditure versus actual expenditure is all tracked per per point of time, and this is reported in a, in a translating <coughs> at a, a, a diagram between planned and earned and as actual occurred on this. And, and you can you can do all of that. 
So we have this kind of spreadsheet set up or, already. If you happen to need to go to that level of details, we can do that. And uh, KT has a lot of earned value spreadsheet set up for Purple Line 3. So we have uh, those level of uh, complexity and sophistication. And it, it depends on what really individual PM needs. Just pretty quick uh, example for that. Uh, where is the here? I think I skipped this one here. Skip. This is the one I wanted to have uh, Rick to cover. Let me just open up this. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. There. The QQC is a big part of the PMP plan, and we addressed that quite a bit already. So we're not going to go through the details of how to prepare the, the design quality control plan, but we're going to talk about the importance of it as it relates to the work we do. And it is a control because it's controlling the, the product that we're putting out there. So some clients require it, as you guys know, and when that happens, this is a template, and we have other templates too, but this is just so you understand that we have this. But, you know, I, I would make, in my mind, there's three reasons, there's probably more, but there's three that readily come to me of why we have quality control. So one is liability. You know, we, we don't want to get in trouble. So we want some controls to make sure we're putting a product out there that's proper and safe and and good. The other one is reputation, because even if we avoid liability, people can scratch their head about the kind of work we're doing. And then those things lead to the third one, which is really important, and that's repeat work. You know, and so we have to, we've got to do good work for people. A lot of times you'll say, why do you use so and so? They do good work. You know, and that's what, what people remember. So we want to make sure that we're doing that. So I wanted to just mention a few key things through here, and I guess, can I scroll this thing? Yeah. So this particular one we did for um, San Nicolas Island, which is a water tank, where we had um, a couple of subs. We had a sub doing the tank, and then we had some electrical sub for the most part. And we managed it, and we did the civil work on this. And so this plan required that we, right up front, say who the team is and who the uh, responsible persons are. Mario, you might remember helping a little bit on this. It's a ways back. <laughs> And they require that. And then the table of contents, which gives you some of just the general things that, you know, one thing is that the general purpose and some of those are to assure the client. They look at this plan and they have some assurance that we're going to follow standards and that we're going to comply with requirements and, and do things correctly and that we have systematic actions. It's not just off the cuff that we have specific actions we take to get that done. So they require, you know, we give a, a write-up on this, and I think we have a lot of this. Peter signed that one. We have a lot of these requirements in other plans, kind of our general template. Mm -hmm. They're repeated here and sometimes elaborated on based on the, the specifics of that client. And then we talk about um, who the responsible people are. So in this case, we had a quality assurance officer. People get confused with quality control quality assurance. One is assuring that the process happens. The other one is the active control and reviewing of, of the material. So in this case, we had all the people identified what they do and what their role is. And then we went in a little further and talked about what their responsibilities are. Then we get into some of the procedures. We define there's some over-the-shoulder things. There's interdiscipline reviews because this plan applies to everybody. It's not just what we're doing ourselves. We have subs. It's about how we assure that their work is correct. We make them follow the same procedure, uh, marking up their plans, you know, like the plans you had at the interview, Marco and Marwan, where we showed the yellowed out stuff and all that. So our subs, we make them provide that same thing to us, and we copy that package to the client so they can see that. Yeah, let's see. Stay there. Just kind of work my way through. This probably gives you a little better picture. I'll just spend a second second on this. One is, you know, quality control 
starts at the beginning. It starts with how we scope the job, because we're going to make sure we know what we're doing. Post-award, so now we've got the job, we're making sure we've already as assembled the team that can do the work correctly. But post-award, these are a lot of the things we're just talking about. Develop the work breakdown structure, critical path method schedule, specific QA, QC plan, review it with our whole team, get to a kickoff meeting, execute the design. Then you get in that middle section is really the checking the plans, using checklists maybe to make sure you don't leave certain things out. So that's the act of checking and with a iterative process if things have to go back for return for back check. And just go a little further. So this, oops, that's not cooperating. Maybe I can get over. Well, it you guys don't mind blue, do you? There we go. <laughs> now we're good. So in this one, we had some of the items that talk about how to check drawings. We actually have, so this is that yellowing out. And of course, you can, you know, there might be modifications to this procedure. I don't know why that is. Uh, I don't want to cooperate. I need a better. I need a better yeah, mouse pad. There we go. So, how we would check calcs, how we, you know, management of the consultants, cross-checking documents to make sure that we have consistency across our documents. I'm trying to get down to one specific item here. I, I just passed something here about assuring that we have biddable documents. So we want to make sure that we're using lessons learned. You know, we run into something where maybe there was a bid bust or there was a ton of RFIs. So on the next one, we learn, hey, you know what? People ask this question. Let's address it up front in our design. So we cross-check some of those things that, that we've learned, which never ends. Communication plan, which Peter described in the other plan. So in this case, they required having all the key contacts and then how, how we talk to each other where that communication occurs. And then they required in this one a, um, an org chart. And in that org chart, they wanted to see, OK, um, down the center there, those are the people who are responsible for getting the design done and all the different tasks. On the right side is the support team to get that work done. On the left side are the people who would check that work independently reporting back through our quality assurance manager. So I know we maybe put some twists on that, but for the most part, we're, we're doing that review. And this is a good model. We don't always have to provide that document. That was a specific request for this one. So now we're just including it in all the ones we give to that client. Although not every manager asked for it. It's just easier we have it. So, and, it, and it, I think they're happy with that. So I think that's pretty much the end. So. Um, you know, the main thing is that we're doing good work. We're using our lessons learned. We have some supplemental checklists that are outside the plan. They're just other things to check against. And, you know, those things are available for use, too. Okay. Thank gotcha. you. Yep. Uh, we don't get into this uh, often, but uh, sometimes we do, especially for NAFSAC. Is that we have the re scoping the project in order to meet the budget. I think architects they do that a lot. Public works tend to not I have in person I have not encountered a lot of cases where we we gone through sixty five percent design, we realize our estimate is too much over the budget. Uh, I heard, I know architects, uh, when they do a development, they encounter those things uh, quite often. Well, some of them, be careful, some of them sign a contract. And if you're a sub, they want you to. But if they're doing work for a school district, not only do they have to rescope that way, they have to give feedback. They get a certain percentage, and if the project comes in lower, they have to give back money because their fee was then too high. You know, it might be determined a year later. But you got to be careful about those things passing through. We are running into scoping problems like that. We have bid busts on a number of Navy jobs on the islands because the contractors are 
they're not putting real numbers in there. Their subs are don't want to work on the island. And they're concerned that they don't have big money for them, even though they give them a number now, when the time comes to do the work, they're not going to be available because they're, they want to do other work on the mainland instead because they're busy. So they're having to, to bid way higher to be able to have the money to pay somebody. What do they call it? Con subcontractor reliability. Unreliability. <coughs> yeah. And so we are right now in the midst of uh, we de-scoped. Well, one, we had to do a bunch of justifications and help them find a way to accept the contractor's bid. The other one, we're in the midst of de-scoping work so that they can award the contract. Let's go back to Congress. Yeah, and we're, we're helping them because it's important for us. You know, they give us so much work that we just got to bite the bullet and support them. Very good. So just uh, close today's uh, session off. Here is a few things that uh, we're hoping to get across. Uh, prepare a schedule to lay out execution timeline. Um, as we should have a habit to do that uh, at the beginning of the project. Uh, we need to know how do you massage the budget? How do you make use of the budget? Have the proper team for for the project. Uh, prepare a project management plan to guide your execution. Uh, to what a level it depends on you know the complexity of the project. But uh, in principle, that's always a good thing to do. How how uh, much detail you put in there is uh, at your discretion. This two here is the key ongoing monitoring and uh, adjustment. You gotta have to react to what has occurred and uh, what you plan it out. Uh, you know, 100% always change. <laughs> the whole, they never stay the same. <laughs> uh, another key skill set of project manager is really uh, anticipate ahead of time. Uh, make sure that you stay on top of the curve. Um, so you don't get surprises, you don't get a surprise calls from the client, from subs, from you know whoever that is. You, you want to uh, be, uh, be in control is what, what uh, really matters uh, most. And that's it. That's the end of the, the presentation.